Hello everyone. Session one of Equity, Excellence, and E-Learning is about to begin. This webinar series is brought to you today by the National Center for Urban School Transformation at San Diego State University in San Diego, California. This series will highlight essential teaching practices and emphasize how they can be adapted and applied by educators providing remote classroom instruction. Opinions and content of this presentation that are of our featured speakers may not necessarily be a direct rep representation of NCUST. This webinar is being recorded as a courtesy to our speakers and your fellow audience members. Please remain muted and do not share your video during the presentation. A copy of today's recording, presentation slides, and resources shared will be available on our website, ncust.com. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Hello and welcome. My name is Joe Johnson. I serve as the Executive Director of the National Center for Urban School Transformation. We are so pleased to welcome you to the first session of our Equity and Excellence through e-learning series. This session will focus on how educators can use online learning strategies to lead students to feel both valued and capable. Since 2005, NCUST has been identifying amazing elementary, middle, and high schools that generate outstanding learning results for all demographic groups of students. Black students, Latinx students, white students, Asian students, students with emerging bilingualism, students with disabilities, students from low income households, and so many others. It has been our honor to identify, award, study, and learn from great teams of educators who truly are generating multiple evidences of both equity and excellence. Not surprisingly, we have seen impressive teaching throughout these schools. In our book, Teaching Practices from America's Best Urban Schools, we endeavor to describe the teaching practices we found most consistently across these outstanding schools. We try to describe in depth how these practices looked and felt. We try to describe what educators did and how their practices differed from the practices of educators in more typical schools. And it's clear to us that the success of diverse groups of students is not an accident. It is a direct result of the school-wide implementation of eight powerful practices. We have learned so much from the schools we have awarded, and we continue to learn even more. This year, we had the opportunity to learn how teachers in our award-winning schools were adapting to the challenges of online learning. We were impressed to find that educators in these schools had thought carefully about how they could deliver equitable and excellent learning opportunities in online learning environments. We found teachers utilizing the same core eight practices, but they had thoughtfully considered how they could tailor those practices to work powerfully even when they did not have face-to-face -face interaction with their students. At INCUST, we firmly believe that our nation should applaud educators for their amazing efforts to adapt quickly to the realities of the pandemic. At the same time, however, we all know students did not benefit equitably. Like so many things in life, 
our first widespread effort to implement online learning is not necessarily the best we can do. This is a great time to ask ourselves, how can we get the most from online learning in ways that ensure equity and excellence for all the students we have the privilege to serve? We believe the teaching practices within NCUST award-winning schools can be applied in ways that make online learning more powerful and more effective for diverse populations of students. So in this series, we are pleased to bring you nine sessions, all centered on what we have learned from amazing elementary, middle, and high schools. Each of the first eight sessions will focus on one of the eight teaching practices we found so consistently. And the final session will focus upon the strategies teachers and school leaders use to promote those eight practices throughout their schools. Now, today's session, this first session, will focus on one of the most important practices. If you asked, well, what was the primary reason Black students at the schools we awarded demonstrated great academic confidence? If you asked, why did Latinx students outperform statewide averages in both mathematics and English for all students in, this, in their states? If you ask, why did students from low-income families excel in ways that enabled them to enter and succeed in competitive colleges and pursue challenging careers? Our first answer is that teachers in those schools led their students to know beyond any doubt that they were valued that they belonged, that they were loved, that they were capable. Educators inspired students to perceive that they had everything necessary to succeed in school and succeed in life. Today's session is all about how educators led their students all of their students and all demographic groups of students to know that educators valued them, believed in them, and believed in their ability to excel. As well, this session is all about how educators are continuing to lead their students to feel valued and capable even in this era of online teaching. teaching. We are thrilled to have some amazing educators to join us in today's webinar, and they will be introduced shortly. As well, I am thrilled to have some of our talented NCUST executive coaches leading this session. Just as importantly, we are thrilled that you are here. We know that every one of you has so many things that you could be doing right at this moment. And we are honored that you have invested this hour with us. And we want to respect your investment by making sure we share practical, useful information that will help you advance both equity and excellence in your classrooms and in your schools. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now my pleasure to turn this session over to a member of our NCUST team, Ms. Chris Marie Erzadowski, who will invite you to share some information about yourselves. If we could have everyone participate in the poll, as you can see, it's asking, there's a window that should have popped up for you. I can see some of you have already started replying. Um, once you've um, replied to the poll, if you could also just move to the chat box, uh, tell us what type of institution you work for and where. So an example would be an elementary school in Iowa. All right. 
So let's see, Shelby, Shelby, is it Shelby County? Um, we've got a middle school in Arizona. Um, we've got a high school in Phoenix. Okay, Shelby County Schools, yep. Um, Ohio Education Association, Memphis, Tennessee, Shelby County Schools, Elementary School in Spokane Valley, Washington. Okay, I think it's Shelby County for the win here. I, I'm seeing a lot of people from there. Um, El Cajon, California, Kansas City, Kansas. Um, middle school, okay, all right. A lot of Shelby schools, Arizona for sure. We're seeing a lot of representation there, Houston, Texas. Okay, great, thanks so much everyone. Uh, looks like we've got a diverse group here today. Let's take a look. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. Let's go ahead and share who we've got here. Okay, okay, so um, we've got a lot of teachers um, here today. Um, school level administrators, district level, a lot of other, other, a lot of other. I'm curious about what that might be. If you'd like, you can go ahead and share that in the chat as well. Um, we definitely want to know who we have in our audience um, to make sure that we're um, providing the best info for you. Um, okay, we've got instructional coaches, instructional curriculum coaches. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Rupi Boyd, Dr. Rupi Boyd, who is an executive coach with the National Center for Urban School Transformation. Dr. Boyd has been an amazing teacher, an outstanding principal, district leader, and district superintendent. We are thrilled to have her as part of the INCUS team. Dr. Boyd. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here to provide the support to fellow educators and administrators. Today, we're fortunate we have with us an outstanding teacher and a principal from one of our 2020 NCUST America's Best Urban School Award. From Silver Wing Elementary and Chula Vista Elementary School Districts, please welcome Principal Teresa Corona and fourth grade teacher Sonia Escobar. Like all of our award winners, Silverwing achieved multiple impressive successes for every demographic group they serve. For example, their Latinx students outperformed the overall average for all students in California on the state's rigorous SBAC assessment. Also joining us today is my colleague from NCUST, Executive Coach Dr. Jose Enigas, also a former teacher, principal, and a superintendent. Now to echo Joe's sentiment, teaching practices we observed over and over again in diverse, high-performing schools are still relevant and need to be adapted to all learning environments. Our session today is the companion to our recent blog, Distant Physically, Not Emotionally, of chapter one of the book, Teaching Practices from America's Best Urban School which focuses on making students feel valued and capable. You can find these on our website, ncus.com. Today we'll be discussing how to make students feel valued and capable. Our panel will share practical approaches for teachers to implement in an online instructional delivery model, as well as how school and district leaders can be of support in providing professional development. More than any other factor, NCUST has found compelling evidence that students are likely to perform at higher levels when they perceive the adults, the educators they encounter at school care sincerely and deeply about them and their current and future well-being. This is especially true for students who are at most vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic and societal unrest. We identified four key elements that are essential in online instruction to ensure all students feel valued and capable. We want to make sure educators demonstrate a commitment to know students better. Model courtesy and respect for each student. Praise and acknowledge each student. Transform traditional classroom practices so all students feel successful. Mrs. Escobar, you're currently teaching a summer class remotely. Principal Corona, your district has decided to start the new school year online. Ask the school, what strategies and instructional tools are you currently using to plan, using and plan 
to using your remote curriculum class to demonstrate a commitment to knowing students better? Um, thank you, Ruby. Um, some of the things that I wanted to touch upon were communication. It's important to, um, to communicate with our students and making them um, feel important. And some of the things that I've done during the summer learning camp was um, use the chat a lot and the emails and the messaging and I've encouraged the students to do that. Um, and they have been more, um, more free to communicate with me that way because they choose the method they want to communicate with me. Even um, Principal Corona brought up using Google Voice um, in the spring. So I started to use that and my students are still using that. So they would call me like the day before summer session started. They called me just to say, OK, I'm getting ready. Where do I do this? Um, so to have give them those opportunities to communicate with me, um, it really makes them feel important in the classroom. Um, additionally, I still focus on social emotional learning every day. Every morning we have a topic that we focus on. And I noticed that the students like to use the GIFs and the memes and the emojis the first day. So one of our social emotional um, learning activities was to create a meme of how they were feeling that day. Uh, because we talked about how distance learning and the pandemic, it's affecting us and our emotions and we want to know how we can control those or work with them. So um, the picture that you see in the slide is a screenshot of some of the memes that they made. So they found the image and they talked, they wrote just one line about how they felt that day. Um, so things like that are encouraging them to, to also participate because some students don't want to show their video or unmute themselves. Um, so this is a way for them to also tell me how they're feeling that day. Um, and I just really encourage them to, to do their best and, you know, um, try out activities. And when I meet with them one on one, I really do take a couple minutes. Just, how are you doing today? How, how is this working for you? Um, how's your dog doing? How's your sister? Um, just to kind of still build that relationship, even though we're not face to face. So. Yes. A big part of our work here at Silver Wing is establishing teacher-student relationships, principal-student relationships from the beginning. So what Mrs. Escobar described uh, is so important to our school and that emotional connection has to happen before that academic connection happens. So we definitely do invest time in those things. So bringing it into the distance learning world, it's how do we continue to do all of those things uh, online? Uh, another important part is following up with absent students. And I really see that responsibility as a principal to not assume that parents don't care or that the child doesn't want to participate in distance learning, but to really find out why. Is it a connectivity issue? Do I need to make sure that you have a Wi-Fi hotspot because you have three siblings that are also in distance learning and uh, you can't all be on the Wi-Fi at the same time? Are there situations and barriers that I need to look into as to why students are absent and not participating? So even with our kindergartners uh, having a uh, virtual meet and greet tomorrow with parents and starting already to make those connections with who my kindergartners are and they are so excited about starting school even online. Thank you both and great points regarding importance of communication and social emotional support. It's great to see that you are utilizing all these tools available that are currently available to all educators online. Constantly finding ways to praise and acknowledge students are a hallmark of award-winning schools. We have observed. How has your school adjusted to maintain that positive feedback and virtually or so socially distance celebrations of student success? Um, well, prior to distance learning, we were doing a lot of shout outs. We had a shout out wall in our multi-purpose room, Falcon tickets, acknowledging students. Um, we would do like a, a classroom celebration once a week. And so in terms of distance learning, we brought that 
online. Um, one of our, one of my colleagues had mentioned it in the spring, you know, that she put shout outs, shout outs um, on our class dojo. So in our classroom dashboard, I also created a shout out wall um, where I could post shout outs, Ms. Corona could post shout outs, and the students can also shout out um, classmates. Some of them started shout, giving me shout outs, so it was just um, funny, but I was like, you can shout out to your classmate too. But it's giving them the voice in the classroom and then also feeling important because they do look forward to um, being recognized even in an online setting. Um, I get asked at the end of each of each of our sessions during summer learning, um, are you going to do your shout outs already? Are you going to are you going to are you going to tell us who got shout outs today? Um, so sometimes I'll do it during the day, but at the end, I really do try to get them all in there. And, you know, thanks for being on time today. Um, thanks for participating during our math or sharing your math problem. So anything that encourages them, I still want them to feel that they're getting that recognition because we're not in school. We don't have a prize box that I can have them choose from. Um, so I, it's there for them to see and then they can show their parents. And we, I do do a weekly celebration. Last Friday was bring your pet to class day. So that was a little, that was fun because everybody brought their dogs and guinea pigs and some gerbil type animals, but they really did look forward to that Friday that we can share our pets. Um, and it was out, you know, it's just a little celebration for us to do online. Um, so I, I still want the students to feel important. And I just, I think we just need to be creative on how we are showing those things, um, even in a distance learning setting. Right. And going along with that, we have some school wide celebrations that part of uh, our success is also meeting every week and what we call our Falcon Rally. It is key to our positive behavior and intervention uh, support uh, program. And so this year, it's having that Falcon Rally school wide every week and not forgetting that those elements are critical to the success of our school and continuing them in the online world. Uh, just like Mrs. Escobar mentioned with her shout outs, uh, I can go in and provide shout outs to the classroom as well. Um, in fact, on the screen, the I'm so proud of you came from, from me for the children taking two weeks out of their summer break to participate in summer learning camp, completely voluntary, and going in and giving them that, uh, that encouragement. Uh, the feedback, equally important in the distance learning world than it is in the real world. Uh, I'm sure that uh, administrators and, and teachers, you know that when you are able to ask a child, how is it going with your project on the desert? Or how is that book coming along? That makes a child feel valued that as the administrator, you know what they are working on. So continuing those opportunities in distance learning for providing feedback, being able to check in with kids and ask them, how is your learning going uh, is, is equally important in the distance learning world. We're also continuing our acknowledgement of positive behavior this coming year, uh, re re recognizing what we call our star students and, and continuing those celebrations important for their achievement. Can I add on, Teresa? Um, about pro providing feedback, I've added, I've allowed students or I've encouraged students to also give me feedback during the week because or during the days because it's this is new for all teachers well a lot of us um to be teaching in distance learning so after a few days of having the kids you know let's try the schedule and these choices okay so what's working what didn't go well this week what should i fix um and the kids are like oh can you add this or can you add that and it's just giving them also the opportunity to give me feedback about how they feel about our distance learning classroom. I think it was really important. Yes, so important. And it is what we do, you know, I have students in the real school world give me feedback or suggestions on how to do our celebrations or how they want something done in school. Recognizing those voices and their opinions continues to be important in the distance learning world. 
Thank you both. That's great ideas. You have shared some wonderful ideas on how both of you are committed to making sure students feel valued and capable with through your praise and acknowledgement of each child. Um, in these long distance environments, you know, text, chat, and emails have been a great resource in connecting with students. How is your school ensuring that you continue to model courtesy and respect for each student in the new normal of remote learning? Um, so during distance learning, I've, I've, ha I've uh, encouraged the students to use the chat, the messaging, email, especially if they don't want to share and unmute themselves. And I think um, students have seen that I respond to every single comment or chat that a child posts in a respectful way, even if it's not the right time for them to post those things. Um, and I've encouraged the students to also do that. And I really have, you know, use the chat button, it's okay. If you don't wanna use, show your camera today or your microphone, but you wanna share and that makes you feel comfortable, um, use the chat button and then, I can, and then I respond out loud like, oh, thank you so and so for sharing and that was a great example. Or if they don't understand, I'm like, oh, it's okay, we'll keep working on it. And the students have seen, okay, she's still responding to me and I can just type it. And that it, the kids have also re started responding back to their classmates in respectful ways. Um, so one of the, sc the screenshot that you see on the screen, um, I started to notice that kids, that my students would put um, little GIFs or emojis if they didn't get something or, or even if they understood something. And it was um, funny because I was really proud of my students because one student was like, I'm confused. And another student was, why you add this? And then they're like, what? So they felt comfortable enough to put that they didn't understand something, but they also felt comfortable enough that they can respond to their classmate who was having a hard time understanding a problem. And then if you continue on, uh, I know it's just part of it, but then they were like, kept, they kept discussing it. And then one was like, oh, and then they put like a yay kind of um, icon. And I just let it happen because I was excited that they responded the way that they did and that they asked for help and um, they were able to um, respectfully respond back to their classmates. Um, so I really do encourage the chat button and I also encourage them to ask questions. So when they go into one on one, when I go into my one on one groups and they're working independently, I understand sometimes they, they get stuck or they have a question. And so I don't tell them like, don't bother me, I'm working with the student. But um, we have practice, like just pop back into the video, into the, our meeting and wait, cause I can see their icon there. And then as soon as I see them, I'm like, oh, hi so-and-so, do you have a question? Are you stuck? And then they're like, oh yeah, you know, can you help me with this? Let me share my screen, I'm stuck. And they, they are all very respectful about it because I've, I've encouraged them to do that. Um, they just wait and they know that they can, ask me for help anytime, even if I'm working with another student. And I at least acknowledge them like, okay, give me 30 more seconds and I'll answer your question. Um, so I think just those kind of practices are modeling for students how they can respect each other. And then that I'm also respecting what they have to say and that they need either help or clarification on um, anything that they're doing. Absolutely, and I think what Mrs. Escobar is describing is she has created relationships with her students that are respectful. And for her to be able to have students giving each other feedback or being safe to say, hey, I don't get this, uh, comes because of the time that she invests in building, of course, that relationship, but for having respect for, for the student. And that's something that is central to Silverwing. So many times in schools, whether it's elementary, middle, high school, we talk about the children respecting the adults, being respectful of the adults in the, in the setting. And here at Silverwing, it's also about adults respecting children and really building a respectful relationship. It's central to what we do here. So that, uh, res respect that uh, is mutual is big to, to our achievement. Uh, also, uh, one of the parts of 
uh, courtesy respect for students is really looking at why students might be disengaged in distance learning. I hit a little bit upon this on, on absent students, but you know, to not assume that the reason that that child has their camera off uh, is because they're, they don't wanna learn because they're disengaged, but to really look at why might their camera be off? Is it the home setting? Is that that they they have uh, they don't want to show their home or or what their home is like? Because as educators in a distance learning world, we are entering the homes of students, their private world that we usually don't see. So really looking at why the disengagement is occurring, and as from the principal side making those one-to-one -one connections to see why a child might might be you know disengaged not participating it's uh, very very important thank you both great points we know that these are the um points that we see in the high performing schools and we notice that kids that feel connected with their teacher and respected really do tend to engage more deeply and have out, outstanding outcomes. Um, it's also great to hear that you are not only supporting them, um, respecting them, but you're also supporting them in their social emotional needs and not just assuming because they're camera self that they're not engaged, which is really an important point to helping kids understand that the world is changing. And great leverage on social media and group collabor collaboration apps like Teams and breakout rooms. I'm going to move to the traditional classroom instruction was already turned upside down at the end of last year. Now that you've had time to be more intentional with your plans for online learning as the teaching medium, how have you transformed traditional classroom practices so all students feel successful? And I know you shared the Falcon Rally, how you're changing that into an online um, um, rally, which was great, but we're also wanting you to expand on some of the other ways you're, you know, transferring those classroom practices to make students feel successful. Um, so one thing that I'm um, like, as, a, as an educator, I need to be uh, mindful is, is to have empathy for my students, because as a teacher, we were, you know, here's distance learning, go. And so the students were also, here's distance learning, go. Um, so I feel like we, we need to have empathy for our students and what they're going through and how they're um, maneuvering through the technology, the assignments, our programs, and think about, okay, what supports are they gonna need in order to be successful? Okay, um, so for example, um, at school, we have a schedule posted, we have um, our norms posted, uh, classroom expectations, and I think in the online setting, those should those are also posted. In my classroom dashboard, we have them on our class notebook. We have the daily schedule so the kids know when their break is, so they're not asking me every 20 minutes, when is my break, or um, when do we start class tomorrow, you know, so they have the schedule there to refer to, just like at school. Um, so it's not a secret, you know, this is what we're doing today. And our structures, there are the routines, I have you know, the assignments posted. Um, one thing that I do offer them is choice. So there are a couple assignments that I'm like, okay, please work on these. And then if you finish, when you're doing independent time, pick, pick a math choice, pick a reading choice. Um, I did that in the classroom anyways. Um, and the kids would go move their clip and they would choose what they wanted to work on during the math block or the reading block. Um, so I offer them choice so they can pick. And it also helps with technology issues because sometimes um, one thing doesn't work for them. So it's just like, well, pick something else. <laughs> because um, Some days we have technology issues that we cannot control. Um, in small groups, I still do small groups. I did small groups a lot in the classroom. I really believe in small groups because you can really focus on the students, what they need um, or what that small group needs. Um, so I do have the independent work and assignments and activities and projects for kids to do independently so I can pull in those small groups. And um, with the schedule, the kids are really like, I'm like, okay, everybody has to check back in at 930. 
they come back in at 9 30 without me asking them so that schedule also helps to keep them like oh i need to go back for a whole group lesson at this time Mm -hmm. um, and then supports and differentiation, um, just like I have them in class, you know, graphic organizers. Uh, one thing that I started to do, and I'm going to give credit to um, an SDSU professor who gave me this idea, um, Professor McDowell, he um, gave, suggested, you know, pre-recording things. And um, I think this is something that I also want to use in the classroom because, you know, for those students who need can you tell me again what to do? What do I need to do again? What do I do after that? You know, they can just, oh, watch the video. I, I recorded myself earlier. You could watch it over and over again. And so um, we, I have a quick video if we have time to, I, I made a video of how uh, we do a math strategy. Chris, is there time to show? Okay. Um, so this is a math strategy that we work on in class. Normally it's called a three read. And this is one that the kids usually, I forgot how to do that. What do I do for this part? So I pre-recorded a video of how to complete the three read. And um, it's part of one of their independent assignments. And I narrate each step. And remember that we do this in this box. We reread the word problem. And the students can watch it and they can pause it so that they can work on their three read for the day. And I think those kinds of, um, the differentiation or those kinds of supports will help students, especially in a distance learning setting, um, because we have asynchronous and synchronous models and they're not always with you. So mm -hmm. this is a chance for them to go in, okay, here are my files, here are the files of all Ms. Escobar's videos, I need this one, okay? Just in case it's not their day to meet with me um, and they, they have that support that they need. So that is something that I have used over the summer um, learning sessions that um, have really benefited the students. Right. Thank you, Chris. And uh, connecting to that piece on empathy, uh, Mrs. Escobar described, of course, having empathy for students. Um, but as the from the principal perspective, is having that same empathy for my teachers and the what they are embarking on, which is a whole different world in distance learning because when you have that understanding and that respect for teachers as the principal, then they then can turn and have that same uh, relationship with their students and build that with their students. So uh, it's very, very important uh, engaging in professional development with teachers uh, on teacher self care. Why do they need to take care of themselves? It's so that then they could provide all of this care and empathy and give students what they need. Um, schedules and structures is something that definitely going into the new school year, we a schedule and a structure within a school contributes to students know what they're doing, what's, what is going to happen, what's predictable. We are working right now on a school-wide schedule and at the very least, a grade level specific schedule. We're still in conversations and discussions with that. Uh, the, the reason being is that we want to provide families with a very structured schedule so that they know when will my child be in synchronous instruction? When will they be in asynchronous? When is lunchtime? When are the teacher office hours? So, uh, we are starting school August 31st, so we are definitely right now beginning that conversation on schedules and structure and want to make sure that we, we provide that for our, our families. Um, small group instruction is continuing in the distance learning world uh, just like it did in the real life uh, school. We do have support teachers, just a couple of support teachers for part time here at school. And those small groups for English language development for re-engagement are continuing in the distance learning world. We're also uh, building on choice. Uh, we do have a physical education and arts teacher here at Silver Wing part-time. And that is also continuing. We wanna make sure that students are having all of those special classes that made Silver Wing who we are that those opportunities continue in distance learning also.
Wow, so many wonderful things. Mrs. Escobar, what does W-O-D-B stand for? Oh, um, it means a which one doesn't belong. It, they are math puzzles. So it's part of my um, math talks or number talks. Um, so this is something that I would do in the classroom. And the, it's very important to continue doing those things because I want students to keep thinking about math. Um, so there are different puzzles that they might show four numbers, for example, a two, a four, a six, and a nine. And the students, they have to determine, there's no right answer or wrong answer, um, but they determine which one doesn't belong to the group and they explain why. And then they kind of have a discussion about like, well, I think it's this one because um, it's an even number, or I think it's this one because it's odd. Um, but it's not just numbers, it could be visuals, um, like patterns, groups of three, um, groups of four. So they work on one every day because I still want them to work on um, the math talks and math reasoning. Right, and if I could just hook on to that, which one doesn't belong is part of our number talk strategy and the focus that we've had at Silverwing for the last three school years in collaborative conversations and discussions. Mm -hmm. So seeing this extension, because I've seen that in Mrs. Escobar's classroom uh, numerous times and then see her being able to replicate the same strategy and build that conversation uh, is equally important uh, in distance learning. So our focus on collaborative conversations and discussions continues in the distance learning time. Yeah. And the, the, their screenshot there is, um, they, did a, they wrote a response to a reading we did. And it is a little bit more difficult to have like everybody's microphones on and have a discussion. So for this one, I was like, okay, type it in your chat, respond. And so they would write, like in my opinion, you know, and they would type out the response. And those are the same structures we would have in class. You know, in my opinion, I feel blank, blank, blank. Um, so I still wanted to use those strategies, but within this chat platform or the post that we use. You two have done an amazing job and it's very evident the relationship that you two have and the modeling of the respect and courtesy and empathy is being transferred down to the students. Also, it's great to hear that the professional development is actually being implemented in the classroom, which is phenomenal. Um, your work is so valuable and you've shared so many innovative ways to share, stay connected, be present and supportive while staying technologically relevant. Dr. Anigas, what are some district level considerations to help facilitate these suggested approaches? Absolutely. Thank you, Rupi, and hi, everyone. Uh, as you know, we've heard some wonderful ideas uh, today uh, to help ensure support for and the continuation of these or even related ideas. I recommend several district level considerations that are highlighted on the slide that you have in front of you. First, system, systemic interior. It, uh, from a district perspective, we recommend that you explicitly communicate to all stakeholders the purpose of these strategies uh, or any similar ones but particularly how they structurally fit within a systemic plan to mitigate the effects of trauma. I say this because depending on your district, social emotional supports may have been a tier two support prior to the pandemic or social unrest, but this year it's more or less a tier one for everyone. And explaining the purpose of the strategies to help students feel valued and capable will help allay any misperceptions about why instructional time is being used to foster personalized relationships with students, especially among certain parents. It also will give parents and staff a better idea as to what additional supports are available should students need them. Funds. Think about how to inform principals of newly available funds and the increased flexibility of existing funds. Principals, as you well know, have less time this year to learn what funds they may use to pay for related professional learning and or resources. Perhaps you can create a, che a cheat sheet of available funds or offer a short online training. Next bullet point, collective bargaining. Consider providing principals with guidance regarding your collective bargaining agreement and recent discussions with bargaining units. This will help principals maximize flexibility they need to meet students' needs. Just one quick example. Secondary teachers, as we know, typically have many more daily contacts, making it difficult to establish uh, personalized or individualized relationships with students. Simultaneously, high school sports, or at least here in California, have been postponed or even canceled this fall. A principal 
may be uncertain as to whether she may uh, capitalize on the situation by paying athletic coaches or even the athletic director their regular athletic stipend in exchange for conducting social emotional check-ins with students. And the last bullet point, professional learning. Given the fluidity of the pandemic, it's reasonable to anticipate a staff attrition rate. With this in mind, consider how to leverage your substitute pool. For example, consider including a good percentage of subs in your training related to these and other practices. Uh, this is going to allow trained subs to seamlessly step in as an alternate should the situation arise. And even though it's an investment on the front end, it will pay off for students and families. The last thing they need right now is further interruption of their instruction should uh, a staff member, for whatever reason, uh, become ill uh, with the pandemic. Also, when planning professional learning for teachers, consider creating a compendium of related resources that teachers may access on demand or asynchronously. And focusing on new practices as opposed to simply disseminating theory or knowledge will certainly help. And with this in mind, the professional learning should include modeling. What does it look like? You're telling me what it is and you're telling me the theory, but what does it look like? Can you model it for me, particularly in an online format? And with that, your uh, PD should also include opportunities to explore ideas in simulations. And finally, opportunities to practice the skills in the context they're gonna be implemented. However, when we say context, we're not just talking about online. It's important to also remember that context includes the demographics of your students. As a sub example here, if you have a large percentage of African-American students, um, you obviously have to be very cognizant as to how some of the societal unrest, police brutality is going to affect them in a, in a way that may differ from other students. And so you need to consider that type of context as well. And then finally, when it comes to professional learning this year, these are uncharted waters for all of that. Us, we have to acknowledge that. And so this can't be a one and done. Your PD has to be part of an iterative cycle. So consider that as well. And so with that, Ruby, uh, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jose. I'm Dr. Anigas, I really appreciate it. Audience, you've heard from our panelists and now we'd like to hear from you. Please type your questions into the chat box and we would love to have our panelists answer them. Okay, I see. Um, uh, Principal um, Corona, I see one question that came up is how do you visit classrooms and the virtual learning to see what instruction is happening? Well, uh, I am part of every group that is a class. So uh, just to clarify right now, I, we have summer learning camp and regular school is starting August 31st. Our collective bargaining agreement does allow for the principal to be in classrooms. So I'm part of every class, every team's group and I'm able to join in into the learning. Do just drop in just like a uh, regular school. And so one more question before we get going. Um, principals, um, Corona or Ms. Escobar, one of the questions is how do you remind students to come back to full class when you have the full class lesson? Because so many kids tend to forget or, or don't have a sense of time. And we were just wondering how do you, what kind of reminders or what kind of tools do you use to help children remember that they need to log back on? Um, so the way Teams works is, why well, I've, I've um, I went over the routines. The first day was a little hectic, honestly, but it's just like any school year. The first day, the first week's a little hectic, but I went over the routines and how it works. And so within our program, they leave and I told the kids, you can hang up on Miss Escobar. It's okay. Um, and then, um, but I'm going to call you back. So the first couple of times it was like, I'm going to call you back. And I put it in the chat. So everybody saw the message and I posted it on our classroom notebook. Come back for group at let's say 9 30. and so at 9 30 you know some kids would pop up a little bit beforehand um but i can call everybody so all i started to do was call everybody um and then they they would answer and so they got used to me they're like well i can just pop back in and my sister doesn't have to call me back and so after a couple of days they just all know they just all pop back in at that time 
Um, but the first couple of days, it was more of a routine. Um, I had to post the time, like everybody come back at this time. Um, and then I would just start calling. But like today, I didn't have to call anybody back. Yesterday, I didn't have to call anybody back. They just know. So it becomes part of the routine. Um, but honestly, the first couple of days are a little hectic to kind of remind them, come back at this time. And so. And that goes back to that schedule and structure, which is, is so important. Um, and that, that kids, in my opinion, do thrive on when, when they have a structure and a schedule. Um, but I do have to say that also goes to Mrs. Escobar's engaging tasks. So if kids in their asynchronous time are excited to come back to the whole group and share what they did during their asynchronous time, that's a big key as well. Thank you. So it's just like uh, being in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Come um, back to the group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have one more question. Uh, we, uh, Pounds, someone from the audience would like to know, could you talk about what your teacher schedule looks like? How often are you meeting live? Oh, okay. Well, that also goes back to Dr. Iniguez's, uh talk on collective bargaining agreement because every district, of course, is different. However, in California with the Assembly Bill 77, that gives specific time that students need to be engaged in either synchronous or asynchronous instruction. So um, let's see, this is new information, but for grades four through six, it's a total of four hours of time, three hours and 50 for grades one through three, okay. three hours for kinder. Um, but what is occurring within the schedule and, and what our goal is with the, either the grade level or school schedule is um, that the times that are, that are small group, the times that are whole group are detailed school-wide. So there aren't specifics on you know 50%, 50%, that type of thing, but that the teacher is providing those opportunities for, like I said, four hours a day for grades four through six. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I think somebody was asking, can you clarify, Sonia? You said call the kids back in. Do you mean phys um, physically pick up the phone and call them or do you have them set a timer? I've had to physically call. Chat? I've had to physically call a couple because they don't answer my call. But within our, um, within our teams, um, we can invite them back in. Um, I can invite them back in and so it looks like it's a call. So it's like oh. it'll call them. And so on their screen, it'll say, Ms. Escobar is calling you. Oh, okay. um, and so I'll invite them back in. But I have had to call some back in for like remind them to come back in. Um, but usually I just invite them back and it sends them like a Ms. Escobar is calling you, come back and join in. And then they join back um, yes. the meeting. Yeah. So call there's me. the actual call with the phone and the call on the on Microsoft Teams is the platform that, that we utilize. Amazing what technology has come to. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, so Dr. Johnson, you're up. You're muted. I want to thank all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you so, so much. Uh, as we think about all of these very, very practical ideas for how we can go about making sure that all of our students feel valued and feel capable, I want to emphasize that yes, this is important in and of itself, for the social emotional benefit of students. But I also want to help all of us understand how fundamental this is to ensuring the academic success of our students. Remember, this notion of leading students to feel valued and capable is something that we have found so consistently at the heart of teaching and learning in schools that are achieving outstanding results for diverse populations of students. So I encourage all of us 
to approach this year with the goal of thinking about how can we shape teaching and learning in a way that all of our students will feel valued and capable so that our students with disabilities will tell us that their teachers make them feel respected and intelligent. Our, our, our students with emerging bilingualism will say, hey, I feel like I belong at the school. Uh, the students who are entering school below grade level will, will talk about a sense of hope because they are convinced that their teachers are committed to their academic success. That, that, that Black students and Latinx students will talk with passion about how their teachers believe in them and make them believe in themselves. That's our goal. And I want to thank everyone for being a part of this. I especially want to thank uh, our, our distinguished principal and distinguished teacher for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much to executive coaches, um, Boyd and, and Iniguez. Uh, and thanks to all of you in our audience. We hope that this series is going to be useful to you as you plan for a school year that supports every student in ways that lead to their social, emotional, and academic success. Our next webinar is scheduled for September 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. This next session will focus on another extremely important practice, focusing on understanding and mastery. A focus on understanding and mastery is quite different from the focus on coverage that may be observed more typically. In too many schools, we've pushed educators to cover the content associated with a pacing guide or a scope and sequence chart with insufficient attention to what, if anything, students understood, learned, or mastered. The AFT leader, Adam Urbanski said, for a teacher to say, I taught it, but my students didn't learn it, it's kind of like a physician saying, I cured him, but he died. We found that teachers in high-performing schools were passionate about ensuring that their students acquired deep levels of understanding and mastery of the concepts and skills taught. Teachers planned meticulously and worked relentlessly, not simply to present lessons, but to ensure that all students understood and mastered the essential concepts and skills associated with the lessons. This next session will help educators think about how online instruction can be implemented in ways that maximize a focus on understanding and mastery for each and every student. We look forward to seeing you back on September 23rd. Thank you so much for participating in this session.